if you are with us for the first time, my name is John, and I'm part of the pastoral team here at Connect Church, and uh, it's a privilege to be able to share with you tonight. Charlene, I wonder if you can do me a favor and just go back to the notices to that slide on deeper. Um, deep as a study into various theological and contemporary subjects. Now, some of you may remember a couple weeks ago, it was longer than a couple weeks ago, a few, uh, maybe a month, six weeks back, that I spoke about the fact that there's too, um, too often we as, as staff in the church are running events instead of equipping the people. And since then, we've done a, a rejig and a rework, and we've evaluated what we, what we are doing. This is one of the things that's come out of that. Now, in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, it says, a God gave some to be apostles and prophets and teachers. Now, for those of you who know Howard, this is his gift. This is what he walks in, one of his strongest gifts, is the gift of teaching. And, and this isn't about doing a course. This is exposing yourself to somebody who has a gift. Does that make sense to you? I don't want us to get the idea we're doing another little course because God has given people to the church for the equipping of the saints so that you and I, we can do ministry well, we can serve God well. This is part of it. So, so I want to encourage you to be there so that you can be exposed to somebody who can teach you to love the Word and apply God's Word. Okay, so just wanted to add a little bit because I think often we just, oh, it's another course that's happening at Connect. And you'll do yourself a disfavor by not allowing somebody who's carrying that gift to minister into your life. All right, so that's just a quick notice. Now we're going to get to the message. Um, thanks, Charlene. I, I, I don't know if any of you, uh, on any of your devices you own, have ever picked up a glitch or something has gone wrong. It can be a computer, there's a bug, it can be a cell phone, whatever it is, and you found yourself needing to press the reset button. And when you press the reset button, basically what that will do is it will take you back to the factory settings. In other words, that's the way they wanted it to be so that it would work properly. And then along the way, you add on stuff, new apps and all kinds of things like that. And sometimes some of those things have got a bug. And then what starts to go wrong, it's generally the thing functions well, but it just keeps on having this hiccup along the way. And so we hit the reset button to take it right back to what it was originally designed to do. Now, sometimes with a church, we need to hit the reset button. Because what happens is God has a plan for His church. God has a purpose for His church. And along the way, we pick up the bugs. And we start doing things out of tradition or because that's just the way we've done it for a long time. And we start missing the plan God has for His church. Now, a few weeks ago, Terry and I were hugely privileged because somebody paid for us to do a trip uh, to Israel, and we were there for, for 11 days. But one of the things that we were reminded of over and over and over and over and over again, that the primary role and responsibility of every Christian is to go and make disciples. And I, I think what's interesting to me is that most Christians have tended to focus on going to church, which I think is good. Sometimes they manage once every three weeks. Maybe to be part of a life group, which I think is helpful. To focus on reading our Bibles and praying. Maybe to even go to an incredible Christian conference where there's an international speaker. And all of those things are brilliant. 
But if I may say to you this evening, I think to a large extent we've not done a good job of making disciples. And I want to say that tonight because if I remember correctly, just before Jesus ascended... He said to his disciples, I want you to go and make disciples of people that will make disciples as well. That seems, if I remember correctly, one of the things that's quite important was quite important to Jesus. And along the way, you're going to discover that us not doing that properly has affected the church. And I'll tell you why. Because we pass on to others what we are passionate about ourselves. And, the, and when we are not passionate about what God's passionate about, we pass on our lack of passion to other people as well. And I think, and this is what I want to talk about uh, tonight, somehow there needs to be a shift that takes place where we get back to what Jesus instructed us as his church to do. In the series, there's the board next to you, called Engage. We've been reminding ourselves over and over again that Jesus instructed his followers to go and make disciples. That, that leading, to the, leading people to the Lord is something we need to be intentional about. We can't just sit back at home and, and say, Lord, will you somehow do something out here that people will get saved? We've got to be intentional about it. We've got to be devoted to that. And that God's empowered us by his spirit for that purpose so that we can make disciples. Now, if the church, and by the church I don't mean the building, I mean people like you and me are going to get this right, then we have to ensure that people know and understand who Jesus is. People need to know and understand what Jesus taught. People need to know what Jesus has come to do for them. People need to understand the life that Jesus has called them to live so that they become followers of Christ, not just churchgoers or nice people. I think we've got far too many churchgoers and nice people. If I remember correctly, Jesus said, I want you to be followers of me. You will remember over and over again, he speaks about, I want you to follow me. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, which is what we're going to read in a minute, Paul talks about the way that he went about doing ministry because believers, and it was quite a young church, so we can forgive them for that in a sense, had started elevating certain people and certain personalities. That They were putting people on a pedestal instead of Jesus. So listen to what he says about his ministry and the, what he did when he came to them to share the gospel. He said, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, and in fear, and with much trembling. I don't know if that strikes you as quite odd. Here was one of the most gifted men you read about in the Bible, and he says, I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling. My message and my, my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith, might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. And friends, if, if we want people to become followers of Jesus, I think there needs to be a fresh reliance on the work of the Holy Spirit, not on ourselves. In the light of what we know about Paul, when I, when I say that, he's... His amazing intellect, this man had a seriously high IQ. His, his passion for God, his giftedness, his willingness to sacrifice for the gospel. In, in fact, he acknowledges that from a human perspective, he had all the right credentials. 
He speaks about it in Philippians 3. Let's just look at that quickly. Though I myself have reason for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. And then he lists all of his credentials. And we've got to ask ourselves, what in the world does he mean when he says, I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. And I think what Paul is highlighting over here is the importance of relying only on God when we do ministry. Paul had to learn to rely on God, not his incredible abilities and skills, fancy oratory or his pedigree. Now I want you to hear me because this is quite important. I'm not saying we shouldn't use what we've got. I'm saying we shouldn't rely on what we've got. Do you get the difference? So, so for Paul, with all that he had, and here's the danger for those who are really gifted, you've got to learn not to rely on yourself, but on the Holy Spirit. You see, it's God's going, the one is the one that's going to do the work through you. I think for some of us, it means the same. It means going before God and being set free from focusing on ourselves. The tendency we have to rely on what we are able to do or our giftedness and our abilities. Listen to this. Paul goes on to say to the Corinthians, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? In other words, he's saying, oh, chaps, there's a problem with that kind of talk and that kind of thinking. And then he asks the question, what after all is Apollos? Can I tell you who Apollos is? He was one of the most gifted preachers of his day. In fact, he would have been a guy you would have said, we'd love to have him as our new senior pastor. That's who Apollos was. He asks the question, and, and what is Paul? And then he answers his question. He says, well, they're only servants through whom... You came to believe, as God has assigned each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes it grow. For other people, it means dealing with the fact that our fears, what people will think of us, how people will respond to us, is often due to the fact we are overly focused on ourselves. I mean, I, I have a, a real sense that this is quite a big issue for us as a generation because we are forever being told, believe in yourself. We are forever being told, we can do it. May I suggest to you this evening, that's the very opposite of what the Bible teaches. Only God can do it. When Jesus said to his disciples in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and eventually to the uttermost parts of the earth. He was saying it, because we receive God's power to proclaim the good news. we meant to do it with His power. That we must rely on the Holy Spirit to be at work through us. We must expect and trust that God will do what He needs to do in the lives of other people. And if we're wanting to see God at work in the lives of other people, then we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. We've got to allow the Holy Spirit to work through what we say and to work through what we do. We've got to ask the Holy Spirit to be at work in people's lives. We've got to be, listen to what the, lead, the Lord is leading us to say and don't try and be God because it just doesn't work. I was listening to a guy preaching the other day as a pastor and, uh, from overseas and he was saying that 
one of the people from, from his friendship circle, uh, who is not a Christian, uh, said to him, can you, can you just tell me what Christians actually believe? And so, like any good pastor would do, he started to explain the gospel and to unpack the gospel to this person. And uh, after he'd done so, he sort of very timidly said, well, are you interested in becoming a Christian? He said, that's exactly why I'm asking the question. I do want to become a Christian. And he said, I was quite taken aback because I don't expect people to respond like that. And I think sometimes that's what's happened to us. We're more expecting people not to respond than we're trusting that God is going to be at work in their lives. Can I say this evening, friends, let's get over ourselves. We need to deal with that once and for all. And, and I say that for a particular reason. We've so got used to being in the center, we no longer know to sit in there. We've got to allow God to be in the center again. Some of the issues we are struggling with is because we're still in the center of the picture. Then Paul goes on to focus on, I think, another issue that's quite relevant to, to us as Christians today, and that is that what Christ has done on the cross is enough. We, we don't have to try and make the gospel more palatable to people or water it down or make it sound less challenging because we, we don't want to be too offensive or we're worried about what people might say because when we do this, we confuse people. We water down the love of God. We undermine the work of the Holy Spirit. Friends, Howard has said this and I've said it over and over again. When people follow Jesus, it's the work of the Spirit. It ain't because of what you and I've done. Why are we scared of the gospel and what God has said in the gospel about the death and resurrection of Jesus? One Corinthians one eighteen, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And friends, when people are being saved, I can assure you, God is at work. God is opening their eyes. God is helping them in their journey. You see, Paul preached Christ and Him crucified because it was the greatest act of love that this world has ever seen or will ever know. Jesus dying on the cross for you and me. Paul said, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, this is not just an event, a terrible event that happened in Palestine over 2,000 years ago. This is God saying, I love you and I'm willing to die for you. And when we preach anything other than cruci Christ crucified, we are robbing people of the truth that God really cares for them. Paul preached Christ and Him crucified because that's the way that people have peace with God. You don't have peace with God through doing right things. You have peace through God because Jesus died in your place and in my place. Paul preached Christ and him crucified. Because when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, it broke the power of sin in our lives. I know we'll face temptation. Sometimes hectic temptation. But may I say this to you, tonight, to you tonight? When Jesus died on the cross, he died to break the power that sin had over us. If the Son will set you free, you are free indeed. That's what that scripture means. Paul preached Jesus and him crucified. Because when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, Satan and his demons were defeated. 
He disarmed, publicly disarmed principalities and powers through his death upon the cross. And while that may be offensive to some and foolishness to others, it's still the only way that people can be saved. We are not saved through any other means than Jesus, the Son of God, dying on a rough wooden cross outside of Jerusalem where he took upon himself your sin and my sin so that we might be free. That's the only way we can be saved. And I just want to appeal to you especially as a younger generation where there's this constant appeal, water it down, change it, modify it. Don't do that because it's the power of God for the salvation of all who will believe. But Paul also points out that through his ministry, people were constantly being exposed to the power of God. He puts it like this, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power for a reason. Here's what he says, here's the reason, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. One of the things God has had to teach me about in my younger years as a Christian, but even as a pastor, he had to teach me about the power of God because I don't think I really got it. Paul spoke about the power of God being the same power that raised Jesus from the dead that is there for me. And part of my struggle was when I listened and where I grew up in the church that I grew up, I very seldom heard people talking about the power of God at work. When I looked at people and I listened to their stories, I seldom heard them telling the story of the power of God in their lives. The power of God to set people free from bondage, from insecurity, from doubt, from a poor self-image, and from all the stuff that's happened to them. Friends, he's come to deliver his church and his people. And I had to experience that in my own life because it's pointless me talking to other people about what I don't know myself. There's no authority in that. But we've also got to deal with what living in this world does to us. The lies that we've been exposed to. Relying on our own understanding. Paul said, I don't want you to rely on men's wisdom, but on God's power. The fact that, guys, do you know that religion doesn't work? And for a long time, I believe the enemy, our enemy, the devil, has been trying to water down the truth of that scripture that when you ask God for boldness, He will give it to you. And I think it's quite significant that in Acts chapter 4, when the early church were praying for boldness, the building shook because God wanted His people to know they will receive power and boldness. And they can believe God for signs and wonders and miracles. When Paul speaks about a demonstration of power, it's because he was seeing it before his own eyes. He was seeing God transform his world. Let me read it to you in case you don't believe me. He starts off by saying, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, slanderers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But here's the part I like. And that's what some of you were part of. That's power. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit 
of our God. Friends, that's a demonstration of power. The demonstration of power is what the Holy Spirit is doing through what we say to people. A demonstration of power is when the Holy Spirit convicts people of sin. And I want to tell you, when people get convicted of sin, you need to know that's of God because people normally hide their sin. I mean, we're coming up to uh, Good Friday and, and Resurrection Sunday this coming weekend. Let me take you back quickly 2,000 years plus ago to a crowd of people who were standing in front of Pontius Pilate. And he says to the people, what must I do with this man? What did they shout? Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. And about six weeks later, Peter is standing in front of a similar group of people. Some of them had been the ones who shouted, crucify him. Crucify him. And he's, he's laying it down. He's saying, you were the guys that crucified Jesus. And instead of them shouting out, crucify, they stop the preacher and they say, what must we do? Friends, that's the Holy Spirit. A demonstration of is when the Holy Spirit heals somebody and, or sets them free. Demonstration of power is when the Holy Spirit gives to people a revelation about Jesus. Do you know that many people you speak to don't actually believe in Him? That's going to change them. A work of the Holy Spirit. Demonstration of power when the Holy Spirit supernaturally interrupts somebody's life who's anti the church and anti Christianity and anti Jesus and turns them into a passionate follower of Jesus. We're reading his own words tonight. His name was Saul and then became Paul. I think we've got to develop the capacity to believe that God still works out good things. Church, we've got to believe it. We've got to undo some of the doubts that influence our perspective of how God works in people's lives. And we need to deal with a theology that suggests that the miracle working power of God has stopped. My understanding of the Bible is that the only reason we are sitting here tonight is not so we can have a good day tomorrow. The only reason we are sitting here tonight is because God in His patience has said, I'm going to hold back until the full number of people who are going to be saved have come into the kingdom. Our message, our ministry, and our testimony must focus on Jesus. What Jesus has done, what Jesus will do for them. And there needs to be a shift that takes place from self to Jesus, from self-reliant to Holy Spirit dependent, from what we can do to what God can do. I felt very deeply challenged as I prepared this message. For me, I heard the Lord saying to me, John, humble yourself again. Get yourself out of the spotlight. You know, I discovered how I know that I'm in the spotlight because most of my prayers are about me. It's 
not wrong to pray about you, but sometimes there's 95% about me and about 5% about anybody else. God's saying to me, John, step aside. Because until you step aside, I can't be glorified the way that I want to. I heard God saying to me, John, I want you to serve others. I was reminded that Jesus took off his outer garment. The Bible says, and knowing he was who he was, he took off. He knew what he was doing. He knew that he had, was seated at the right hand of his father. He knew he was God most high and the son of the most high God. And friends, he took off that outer garment and he washed people's feet. Feet, excuse me. Friends, we are here to serve. We're here to serve one another. And we're here to serve the broken where we are in. We need to be a church that every day goes back to God and we say, God, will you fill me with your spirit? Will you empower me for today? You know, for a long time, that scripture in Matthew 28 Verses 18 to 20, you know, it says, go and make disciples of all nations. I kind of had the idea, that's a special event that you do. That's kind of a special, for a church that's got an outreach program, you do that. We're going to go to, down to the market and share Jesus with people. That's the time I go and make disciples. The interesting thing about that scripture, it's, what it actually says is this, in your coming and going, day by day, make disciples. That suggests in your coming and your going, all of the time, that should be a priority for the church. And if it's not, hit the reset button. Let's go back to the default of the manufacturer. Because it is his intention that you and I would see people becoming followers of Jesus. My message and my preaching was not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. I'm going to ask you tonight to consider something, and I'm going to call you to respond to it. Right up front, I'm going out on a limb. I'm tired of just preaching sermons so that people can say, what a wonderful sermon, hopefully. I think it's time that we put ourselves aside and we put God in the center again. I really mean that. One of the biggest things hindering the gospel at the moment is me. It's because there's too much focus on me. I want to ask you tonight, if you as a church, or those of you, whoever the Lord is speaking to, because I can't assume it's everybody, but whoever the Lord is speaking to tonight, you will say, Lord, I come to just lay self down. I'm coming to humble myself before the Lord. Come on. I'm Lord, I'm willing to lay it down for your sake. Because my, the goal of my life I must, I must give what I've got left of my life to you for your purposes. I did a funeral this past Wednesday. I was reminded again at the funeral, you take nothing with you except what you've done for Jesus. It's the only thing you take with you. So if you have a sense that God has spoken to you, I'm going to invite you to stand I want to pray for us this evening. So here's your opportunity if you'd like to respond. Please don't be under pressure from people around you. That's the last thing we want. Just hold out your hands. 
as an act of surrender, but also hold out your hand saying, Lord, I've come to receive. Jesus said, if any person would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And very often, and rightfully so, we focus on if anyone would come after me, let him deny. The word deny is being central. I want to shift that a little bit and go to himself. reminded again this morning that in Acts you've got that, that account of where people were, got into the occult. They came one day and they, they brought all their books and their scrolls and their parchments and everything that they'd done for occult practice and they burnt it publicly. Tonight we've got to just burn this thing called self that gets hold of us. And I really mean it. I, I think Satan has done a brilliant job of making us a self-centered, self-focused generation. And tonight we're saying, God, we put a stop to that. And Lord, we are coming to you tonight, not because we've got it all together. We're coming before you in humility, Lord. We're coming to ask you, Lord, to help us with one of the big struggles we always have, it's the struggle we have with ourselves, Lord. But Lord, I'm totally confident tonight that you can give us victory over that. I'm totally confident tonight, Lord, that each day of this week that lies ahead and the week thereafter, we can be more spirit-focused, have our minds more fixed on what the spirit desires. And Lord, will you take us through a process of being Christ-centered, Jesus-focused, willing to serve and willing to give. Because, Lord, that's what you intended your church to be like. Lord, I'm just asking for grace for us tonight. Just tons of grace. And then, Lord, will you, will you shake the place again? Will you shake the place again? Shake all the stuff out that shouldn't be there. Lord, will you, will you give us boldness? Not that we'll feel better, but Lord, we'll believe that we're spirit-filled. Lord, will you do signs and wonders and miracles to glorify your name? God, be glorified in your church. In Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Thank you.